As far as inequality is concerned, it's been growing quite rapidly worldwide. Uh, every year, uh, Oxfam, leading development agency, uh, publishes a detailed, extensive report of the state of poverty and inequality in the world. In the year 2014, uh, they found that about 90 individuals uh, literally had half of total world wealth, which is an extraordinary degree of inequality. Uh, uh, in the year 2015, their latest publication, which just appeared, it's, the number has been reduced from 90 to 62. 62 individuals hold half the world's wealth. And there are many very ugly consequences to this. Uh, to take one example from the Oxfam report, uh, they point out that five million children are dying of starvation every year. That means about 500 or so while we're meeting, 500 children starving while we're talking. And they could very easily be saved. The resources are certainly there to save them. But policy is designed so that it goes to enriching the super rich and the powerful, not to saving millions of children from starvation. Uh, the, the, there is an organization of the rich developed countries, the OECD, <coughs> uh, the 31 countries. Uh, among the OECD countries, the U.S. is at the extreme in both inequality and poverty. I'll just quote from the latest OED uh, report on this. It says, uh, the share of top incomes in the past year increased especially in English-speaking countries in the United States far more than others. And by the top incomes, they mean the top 1%, by now a fraction of 1%. That's where there's been an explosion of uh, uh, inequality, huge explosion, uh, primarily in the United States, also to some extent in other English-speaking countries. Uh, and uh, uh, poverty uh, remains at extraordinary levels uh, with regard to poverty and inequality uh, by most measures uh, in the OECD studies the United States ranks with the poorest of the 31 countries it ranks alongside of Mexico and Turkey uh, poverty rates and inequality in the United States are much greater than poor or quite poor European countries like Portugal and this has been consistent over 50 years. Uh, the same is true of measures of so social justice. That's measures that include things like uh, infant mortality, uh, uh, hunger, and so on. Of the 31 OECD countries, the United States ranks 27th, right down to the bottom, right along with Greece, only slightly above Mexico, and Chile, and Turkey. Uh, that uh, there is uh, an associated and quite striking fact, which you perhaps have read about in the newspapers. It's recently been discovered that among a sector of the American population, uh, less educated uh, whites, mainly white males, that means with only high school education, uh, among this large sector of the American population, uh, life expectancy is actually declining. Now, that's something that is unheard of in rich societies. The life expectancy continually rises. The United States is not particularly high in life expectancy, uh, but for the, that life expectancy should reduce among a major sector of the population, less educated white males. That's unheard of. Uh, these are surely consequence, all of this is surely a consequence of uh, the neoliberal policies of the past generation, uh, deregulation, marketization, uh, decline of public institutions, and so on. It has led to a general, in the United States, and similar things are even worse elsewhere, it's led to a stag pretty much stagnation for much, in fact, the majority of the population, uh, sometimes decline, uh, real wages, actual wages uh, uh, evaluated relative to inflation, real wages for male workers 
are now at the level of about the late 1960s. There's been considerable growth, but it's gone into very few pockets. Uh, the last couple of years, uh, almost all the growth has gone into a tiny percentage of the wealth, the wealthy population. Uh, the uh, so that there is, in fact, now this radical concentration of wealth, and not in parts of the population that are really productive. Much of it is in the financial institutions, which have a dubious and maybe even harmful effect on the economy. And this is uh, understood by the major uh, uh, powerful institutions. So, for example, a couple of years ago, Citigroup, one of the major financial institutions, uh, published a report for its for the for the investors the investors in the Citigroup deals with and it urged them to uh, direct their investments uh, to what they call the plutonomy index plutonomy means the sector of the population the wealthier sector of the population they said worldwide incidentally so the plutonomy is a worldwide class system of very wealthy people uh, the uh, and it says the uh, mostly in the United States, but also some elsewhere, some in China, some in Saudi Arabia, and so on. But primarily in the United States, that uh, that's where the real good investment opportunities are. You can kind of disregard the rest; they're not important. And in fact, it's now common to dis to divide the world's population into a plutonomy, which is the uh, upper sector of wealth and power. Uh, and the, what's sometimes called the precariat, the people who live precarious lives uh, without security, without benefits uh, uh, in many countries, uh, uh, including rich countries in Europe. Uh, there's the unemployment among youth is extraordinarily high. Uh, people are living at home into their 40s, can't, can't start families, get no jobs. Uh, and uh, uh, so that's the precariat, part-time jobs, no, no just, uh, same in the United States, uh, take colleges and universities, which increasingly are hiring temporary workers, uh, adjuncts, uh, graduate students, people of no protection can be dismissed easily or paid very little. Now that's the precariat. Uh, so the world is kind of dividing into a plutonomy and a precariat, and as many have pointed out by now, the super rich really inhabit a, a different world, a world that barely has contact with the general population, except to, to extract resources from them. Well, there's much debate about the causes for all of this, it turns out to be many complexities, but there's ample evidence that it doesn't have to do with any economic laws, but to largely with uh, policy decisions, uh, not economic necessity. And uh, if you look at the policy decisions keeping to the United States now, uh, we should recognize that the United States is uh, different from other societies in many ways. Uh, one way is that it's by far the richest society in the world with incomparable advantages. That's been true since its founding, in fact, uh, throughout its history. Uh, the United States has, has been uh, the richest or close to the richest country in the world by the late 19th century the US economy was greater than that of the other advanced societies combined uh, 20th century uh, uh, just uh, accelerated this I'll come back to it uh, so, uh, but though the United that's one respect in which the and of course the United States has enormous advantages huge territory relatively un underpopulated once the indigenous population was eliminated or destroyed, uh, enormous internal resources, uh, extraordinary security, and so on. But also, to an unusual extent, the United States is a business-run society. It's partly the result of the fact that it didn't grow out of existing feudal institutions. It uh, became, to a high extent, run by the business world. And that's revealed in many ways. So take, say, uh, voting, much on everybody's mind right now. Uh, the United States has a pretty high abstention level, people who don't vote. And that's been investigated with interesting results. Uh, one of the leading scholars who uh, studies uh, uh, contemporary electoral politics, Walter Dean Burnham, very distinguished scholar, 
about some years ago did a study, careful study of the socioeconomic profile of non-voters in the United States. And what he discovered is that uh, their socioeconomic profile matches those in Europe, similar societies, those in Europe who vote for labor-based or social democratic parties. That sector of the population in the United States just doesn't vote because uh, nothing represents them. There are no such parties. Uh, just recently, uh, uh, Dean Burnham, same scholar, and uh, Thomas Ferguson, a very prominent political scientist, uh, did a careful, very careful study of voting in the most recent election, 2014. Did a careful county by county study of uh, just what voting was like. And they came out with a pretty spectacular conclusion. It turned out that voting in that election was approximately the same as in the 1820s when the vote was restricted to property white males. 2014, about the same level of voting, which tells you quite a lot about participation in what's called a democratic society. And these results are amplified when we look at how people are represented by their own representatives. There's a way of studying that. It's a major topic in uh, academic political science. Uh, you study the policies that the representatives vote for, that's public, and you study the attitudes of the people who, who they represent, their preferences. We know a great deal about that from extensive and quite reliable and consistent polls. And it turns out that for about 70% of the population, the lower 70% on the income wealth scale, they're basically disenfranchised. Their own representatives vote in ways dissociated, unrelated to their preferences. Uh, as you move up the income wealth scale, you get a little more influence on representatives. And at the very top, which means really a fraction of 1%, policies are essentially made. Uh, that's, that's very good work on that by Mark Gillens, Larry Bartell, other mainstream political sciences. Now, there's a recent study by Gillens and uh, Benjamin Page, another well-known political scientist, published at Princeton University, in which they investigated a couple hundred major decisions that were made and they by the political system, and they compared the decisions with popular attitudes. And here's their conclusion. I'll quote it. Uh, economic elites, I mean, tiny fraction of economic power, uh, economic elites and organized groups representing business interests have substantial independent impacts on U.S. government policy, while average citizens and mass-based interest groups have little or no independent influence. The results provide substantial support for theories of economic elite domination and for theories of biased pluralism, but not for theories of majoritarian electoral democracy or majoritarian pluralism to decode to the political science rhetoric. Uh, what it means is, in simple words, the United States is a plutocracy with some formal democratic elements that are increasingly at the margins. And the public is aware of that. Uh, they may not read, people don't have to read the political science journals to see it in their lives. We see it in much of what's happening now. There have been polls about taxes for decades, regular polls. Uh, basically two questions. People are asked, uh, are your taxes too high? And people say, yeah, I'd like to pay less taxes. Uh, are taxes on the rich too low? Sure, the rich ought to pay much higher taxes. That's consistent. And it's very interesting. There have been a few studies to, which showed that when these polls are reported, it's typically the first question that's reported taxes are too high, not the second question, which says taxes are too low on the wealthy. And you go back to the 1950s, the Eisenhower period, taxes on the wealthy were far higher. The uh, top rate was 90%, in fact. It's been cut back regularly over the years in direct opposition 
to the popular will. Uh, so by now, in fact, uh, uh, the poor probably pay a larger percentage of their income than the rich in taxes when you consider the whole array of uh, largely regressive uh, uh, taxes, state, local, um, social security, and so on. Uh, that's, uh, uh, these are all the effects of policy decisions in recent years, which have uh, led to the uh, extreme inequality and the maintenance of very high levels of poverty. Uh, ever since uh, the end of the Second World War, uh, picking up in the 1970s with the neoliberal programs, uh, and the net effect of it is uh, what we see today. Uh, policies of deregulation, which have led to regular crises, concentration of wealth in financial institutions, uh, 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 Bill Clinton's program of destroying the welfare system, uh, ending welfare as we know it, had a really seriously harmful effect on the people who need welfare, especially women with uh, dependent children. Uh, right now there are three million children in the United States who are living on less than two dollars a day. Uh, lots of unskilled labor, which helps uh, because there's a work requirement, which drives down wages, there's much else. Uh, there's a kind of a vicious cycle. Uh, the increase, the concentration of wealth, leads to concentration of political power, leads to policy choices that increase the concentration of wealth and maintain poverty.